Hi, I'm Jim Ballou. And I'm Becky Johnson. So you've just been told to watch this lecture. You probably got a lot of questions. What's it like to be in my class? Come on, let's find out together. This class is called Clinical Medicine. Let the name work for you. It's medicine in the clinic. Hey, guys. Up, hey. In today's class, we're going to be talking about GI pathology. Hey! Keep it simple. It's the pathology of the GI. Have you ever tasted a rainbow? In my class, you will. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed our intro. Um, so we're going to be talking about gastrointestinal pathophysiology, um, specifically the intestines, appendix, and hemorrhoids. So first we're going to have some PT words of wisdom, of course. So life is like a sewer. What you get out of it depends on what you put into it. And I think those are all words that we can live by. So we're going to start off talking about malabsorptive disorders. Um, so malabsorption of nutrients occurs with a lot of diseases. Um, and normally this affects the small intestine because that's where uh, most of your absorption takes place. So celiac disease is the most common. We're gonna talk about that a little more um, coming up. But other diseases can um, affect this as well, such as um, infectious diseases, short gut syndrome from surgery. So if they have to go around part of your bowel because for whatever reason that can affect it. Um, structural defects like strictures and fistulas, and uh, deficiency of digestive enzymes like pancreatic insufficiency. So anything that really affects how you're absor absorbing nutrients. So let's talk about celiac disease. So I'm sure you all have heard about this, but what exactly is it? It's an immune mediated disorder. Um, it's triggered by gluten entering the digestive tract. Um, it was once thought to be very rare, but as we all know, we've all heard about it. Um, it is way more common now, especially in Western cultures. Um, it's believed to be a, in about 1% of the population and that number is rising. So it is an, an immune, uh, autoimmune disease. And so a risk factor for having it is having other autoimmune diseases. Um, Immunoglobin A deficiency is another risk factor. Having genetic syndromes like Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, having a family history, type one diabetes and thyroiditis. So in order to have celiac disease, you must have a genetic predisposition. This isn't something you can just randomly develop. Um, so it's associated with the HLA DQ2, which is the most common and the HLA DQ8 genotypes. 30% um, of white people actually carry this gene, but just because you have the, the gene doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get celiac disease. So that's important to know. Um, there's believed to be other genetic contributions to it. And what causes the complications with it is that you have chronic inflammation and malabsorption of nutrients. So clinical manifestations for this, there's a lot of different symptoms that can occur. Um, some people will experience no symptoms, others will have life-altering horrible symptoms. It's hard to diagnose because a lot of the symptoms are just common indigestion, you know, gut problems that, you know, everyone kind of experiences from time to time. But typically it's characterized by severe diarrhea, bloating, indigestion, flatulence, weight loss, and abdominal cramping. Um, if you don't catch this, malabsorption and malnutrition can occur, so it's important to catch early. And because you're not absorbing um, food, you're also not absorbing nutrients. So the most common ones are iron, folate, fat-soluble vitamins, and vitamin B12. Uh, dermatitis repetiformis can also occur, which is kind of like red, scaly, um, itchy blisters on your skin. Um, so that's not fun either. In the long term, you can develop things like osteoporosis, infertility, coagulation abnormalities, anemia, neurological problems, and possibly cancer. And all of that's just from the inflammation or not being able to absorb what your body needs. So the pathogenesis of it. Um, so 
if you have celiac disease and you're exposed to gluten in the small intestine, um, it's going to trigger an immune response, which will lead to the aggregation of T cells into the muco mucosa of the small intestine. And that immune response will lead to the destruction of intestinal cells. So you can see in the picture, there's healthy villi and celiac disease villi, and you can see the atrophy that's going on. And really that's getting rid of a lot of surface area. So you have less area for um, absorption of nutrients. Um, this is linked to a high risk of cancer from the chronic inflammation. And you can also get dermatitis herpetiformis from the antibodies. So to diagnose, we'll start with serologic testing. They're gonna look for IgA antibody tests initially, and then IgA anti-EMA for a confirmation test. Um, they might take a small intestine biopsy to look for that atrophied villi in the small intestine. So there's a four out of five rule for confirmation, and I would definitely pay attention to this, um, but you have to have four out of these five to um, get a confirmation for your diagnosis. So typical symptoms for celiac disease, positivity of serum IgA class and autoantibodies at a high teeter. You have to have HLA-DQ2 and or HLA-DQ8 genotypes. Um, if you have celiac and enteropathy found on a small bowel biopsy and a positive response to a gluten-free diet. So treatment for this, there's no way around it. It's a gluten-free diet. There's no drugs or anything you can take. Um, and if you stick to that gluten-free diet, then these people can have a very asymptomatic life and be fine. Um, that's a lot easier to do now than it was in the past because a lot of restaurants are way more accommodating now and people actually understand the disease and it's not just like a, oh, I'm not eating bread. It's like, I really can't have bread. <laughs> So the PT implications for this, um, so these people are likely to have malabsorption issues, which can lead to paresthesia, muscle weakness, muscle wasting, fatigue, and weight loss. Um, you're also going to have malabsorption of nutrients, especially calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and potassium. And all those can lead to paresthesia, tetany, and then a positive trousseau and Kvesky, and Trevesic signs. Um, so the Charisseau sign is <clears throat> if you have um, compression in the upper arm, like a blood pressure cuff, it's gonna cause a carpal spasm. So their hand's gonna like do this. And the Trevesic sign is muscle spasm. So if you tap on the facial nerve um, right by the parotid gland, it'll cause a facial spasm, like this side. Um, so you can also get muscle spasms from an electrolyte imbalance and pregnancy, you're gonna, these people might easily bleed and bruise from vitamin K deficiency. They could have generalized swelling from protein depletion and it can lead to osteoporosis, bone pain with fractures and skeletal deformation. So next up, we're gonna talk about vascular disease. So blood is supplied to the bowel by the celiac and superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. Um, these arteries have intercommunications with the pancreas and along the transverse bowel. And obstruction can cause, um, you know, lesions and embolism, obstruction's bad. So we're going to talk about intestinal ischemia. So that is decreased blood supply to the bowel. Um, there's three different types that we're going to talk about. Acute mesenteric ischemia, um, chronic mesenteric ischemia, and colonic uh, ischemia. So acute mesenteric ischemia is the very bad one. It is a medical emergency, uh, life-threatening. So that is due to occlusions of visceral branches of the abdominal aorta. Um, the most common vessel involved is the superior mesenteric artery, and that's about 50% of the time. So what leads to it is um, either left ventricular or atrial thrombi from AFib, or it can be in response to some event that causes hypovolemia. So you can get um, protective vasoconstriction from some kind of traumatic event like an MI, cirrhosis, renal failure, bypass surgery, sepsis, stuff like that. Um, 
And if the event like keeps going or you stop it, but there's no hemodynamic improvement, you're gonna get ischemia. So the signs and symptoms for this are abdominal pain, blood in the stool, nausea, vomiting, fever, high blood pressure shock. Um, most people that get this are 50 plus, and this can cause mental status change in the elderly. Um, and if you need an example of someone who is 50 plus, we have a photo down here to help you out. So to diagnose this, um, we can do an angiography, a CT angiography, magnetic resonance angiography, and they're gonna do all of these just to determine the involved vessel so they can correct it properly. So treatment, you're gonna correct the underlying problem, most important, and then try to resuscitate it, blood flow back as best as you can. Um, for those with thrombotic um, embolotic disease, there's surgery to remove the necrotic tissue and the perforated bowel. Um, they can do a thrombectomy to repair the artery and they can give thrombolytic uh, agents. Prognosis, this has a pretty high mortality rate, um, so it's really important to get people treatment right away if you start noticing these signs and symptoms. So next we're going to talk about chronic mesenteric ischemia. Um, this is also known as intestinal angina, so just, you know, intestinal pain. Um, it's an arthrosclerotic disease of the splachnic arteries. So this one occurs after you eat. So you're going to have abdominal pain after meals about 30 minutes to three hours. Um, and that occurs because you need more blood supply to the bowel for digestion, but the blood is having trouble getting there, so you get pain. I'm going to diagnose this with an MRI and CT angiography. Um, treatment, most of the time, they're just going to do bypass, just take the bowel, reconnect it somewhere else, go around the problem area. They can do an angioplasty or they can do a stent to help with blood supply. So the last one is um, colonic ischemia. So this one has a wide array Wide, uh, wide spectrum of ischemic injury from transient to severe and sudden onset colitis. Um, it's got a pretty low mortality. It's pretty common, usually in people 60 plus, and it's usually the descending sigmoid and splenic flexure parts of the colon that are involved. So the risk factors for this are aortic or cardiac bypass surgery, um, an event that results in hypotension, if you're taking oral contraceptives, if you're doing cocaine, um, if you're in a hypercoagulable state, or if you're um, working out for like a really long time. Signs and symptoms, you're gonna get left lower quadrant abdominal pain. You're gonna really feel like you need to go to the bathroom and defecate and um, red and maroon rectal bleeding. So to diagnose this, they're gonna do a colonoscopy. Um, and treatment is um, IV fluids, the, correcting the underlying problem, stop meds if those are the problem, and or drugs, um, and do surgery if needed. So PT implications of intestinal ischemia. Um, so what you have to be careful of is uh, this can lead to intermittent blood pressure changes, especially at the thoracolumbar junction with exertion. So monitoring vitals is really important. You don't want someone passing out on you. Um, and signs to refer if they have the clinical presentation of, um, you know, intestinal ischemia, and they also have past medical history, uh, CAD risk factors, and PVD. So thanks, guys. Hey, guys, I'm Katie, and today I'll be talking about inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. It's actually two different inflammatory conditions. So it can either be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. They're both chronic disorders of the bowel, um, but their cause of onset is unknown. Scientists have an idea that it is involving genetic and or immunologic influences on the GI tract. Anyone can get it. It doesn't matter about gender or age, but um, we usually do see a peak in incidence between the ages of 15 and 30. And Crohn's disease can actually first appear in someone over the age of 50 years. Ulcerative colitis does have a greater incidence and prevalence rate than uh, Crohn's disease. 
And right now, over 1.5 million people have IBD in the US. Most frequent in the US and in Europe, Asia sees the fewest cases. So maybe that gives us an idea of like the genetic makeup or um, environment or diet differences between cultures. Okay, so in Crohn's disease, and as you can see in these pictures, it affects only segments all throughout the large and small intestines and the rectum. And um, there's no pattern really. But in ulcerative colitis, it affects only the descending colon and the rectum. So that's something to distinguish between the two when doctors are looking for a diagnosis. So as I said, the cause is unknown. It's a mixture of genetics and interactions amongst the gut microbiota, post immunity and intestinal mucosal response. So a specific type of IBD is dependent on that person's genetic variation. Um, the controlled response of the intestinal mucosa, what they're talking about is the mucosal lining of the intestinal wall. It's maintained by toll-like receptors or TLRs and nucleoti nucleotide binding oligomerization <laughs> domain-like receptors. That's a mouthful. Um, so a decrease in your gut tolerance to microorganisms in the colon increases your risk of IBD. So we want, to we want to have a good response, a good tolerance to anything that our environment or what we ingest throws at us. Um, an increased density of microorganisms in people with, there is an increased density of microorganisms in people with um, IBD because their body is not able to deal with them. And so they kind of just build up. People with CD or Crohn's disease often have higher antibacterial antibodies than those with ulcerative colitis, fun fact. So some clinical manifestations include the overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, this leads to ulcerations, fistula formations, and strictures. Um, the <clears throat> In Crohn, people with Crohn's disease, we often see a cobblestone appearance of the mucosal lining of the colon. Um, patients will also present abdominal pain. Well, they may present, I'm sure it's different for everybody. Abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloody stools, abdominal masses, anorexia, weight loss, skin rashes, and or joint pain. As you can see in this lower corner, this is what we want our colons to look like. And it does look different between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, inflammatory bowel disease is diagnosed several ways, or it can be, um, by endoscopy for Crohn's disease, a colonoscopy for ulcerative colitis, um, x-ray, MRI, CT scans, stool samples to rule out infection, and blood tests to confirm the diagnosis. Prognosis, um, well, as I said earlier, it's a chronic and sometimes debilitating disease. Um, it's different for everybody. Someone, this can affect their life entirely, and other people are able to manage with it. Um, it does increase your risk of intestinal cancer. It also in increases your risk of colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is responsible for 20% of IBD-related mortality. The duration of the disease and early diagnosis and severity of the disease um, make a difference. So, of course, the earlier that you're diagnosed with IBD, the sooner you can um, you can treat it, you can be aware of it, what sets 
what kind of flares up your colon and what works for you to make your quality of life better. Um, ulcerative colitis has a good prognosis during the first decade after diagnosis, thanks to modern medicine. Mm -hmm. um, chronic di <laughs> uh, Crohn's disease is chronic. It is without cure. It's mostly intermittent, intermittent um, so it has its flare-ups and its nice uh, bouts of remission. But eventually, eight, 60 to 80% of people do require some sort of surgical resection, which is the removal, as you can see in this top corner here, it's a removal of um, some scar tissue, uh, inflamed and non-functioning uh, body parts in the colon and intestinal area. Treatment, antibacterial medications have no effect on ulcerative colitis. So we can rule that out if, they, if someone has that kind of IBD. Antibacterial and antibiotics provide some benefit with, those, with Crohn's disease, um, but it's not going to, you know, take care of it all together. As the previous slide said, there's no cure yet. <laughs> um, amino salicy salicylates and corticosteroids do treat inflammation. Immunomodulators regulate immune system and biologics increase reaction prevention. Um, so it increases the gut's ability to react to those micro, microbial um, extra by bacteria in the large intestine. And then of course, surgery, if someone needs to have a resection. PT implications, what this means for us. Um, what we can often look for in patients with Inflammatory bowel disease is referred pain in the low back and or lower extremities, an antalgic gait because of pain, um, so as abscesses, and it can be painful in the groin area to do hip flexion, joint pain, inflammation, of course, uh, low bone mineral content would lead to high prevalence of osteoporosis. We might have to inform our patient about um, why they're feeling certain joint pains. And um, we need to be aware of what medications the patient's taking and educate the patient on their hydration and nutrition, exercise, which can help with moderate depression, move, uh, boost immunity, and combat, combat effects of long-term corticoid corticosteroid use and help improve body image. Life isn't easy for some people with IBD. Like I said, it's, it can be debilitate, debilitating and take a toll on someone's mental health as well as their physical health. Um, which leads me to the next bullet point, teach stress management and relaxation techniques. This can include breathing, stretching, um, some sort of meditation, really help that person get through this rough, rough change of lifestyle it, because it's not going anywhere really and um, help treat their quality of life. All right, so our next disorder is irritable bowel syndrome. It has a worldwide prevalence of 10 to 15 percent. Women are affected twice as often as men and the onset of symptoms usually occurs between the ages of 20 and 40 years old. It's associated with a few other pain syndromes and disorders, such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, TMJ pain, anxiety, and somatization. Its etiology is a little bit complicated because it's considered a functional disorder due to symptoms not being attributed to an identifiable dysfunction or abnormality of the bowel. Um, there are multiple theories. A couple of them include altered GI motor activity, altered intestinal microflora, a link between the interaction of the nervous system and the immune system. 
but no one's really sure exactly what causes it. Um, we do know that the signs and symptoms are made worse by stress and negative emotions. The symptoms are chronically recurring abdominal pain or discomfort in the lower quarter. The pain can be steady or intermittent, and it's dull and deep with sharp cramps after eating. They also experience altered bowel habits in the absence of structural inflammatory or biomechanical abnormalities. Like I said, that's why it's considered a functional disorder. Pain usually resolves with evacuation of the bowels. Um, individuals can also experience nausea and vomiting, anorexia, sour stomach, and flatulence. The symptoms usually disappear during sleep or at night, and there are periods of remission and exacerbation of the symptoms. There are four types based on the main signs and symptoms. So IBSD is diarrhea predominant, which is when greater than 25% of the stools are loose and watery and less than 25% are hard or lumpy. Constipation predominant, which is IBSC, is when 25% of the stools are hard and lumpy and less than 25 are loose and watery. Mixed symptom IBS is when greater than 25% are hard and lumpy and greater than 25% are also loose and watery. And then we have unsubtyped IBS, which is when there's an insufficient amount of consistency of the stool to meet any of the other uh, three criteria. To diagnose, they'll usually want to get a medical history, rule out other conditions. The main diagnostic criteria is the Rome 3. So that's um, when they require recurrent abdominal pain for at least three days a month in the past three months with an onset of greater than six months. And it also has to be associated with two or more of the following diagnostic criteria. There's more diagnostic criteria. I think there's like a total of 11 or 12, but I, I listed a few of them here. Um, it includes being greater than 50 years old, documented weight loss, onset associated with a change in frequency of stool. Anemia can also be an indicator of IBS. So you'd wanna run a complete blood count test um, to look at those results. And a colonoscopy is also possible. For treatment, the goal is to relieve signs and symptoms because the cause is unknown. Medications include um, fiber supplements, antispasmodics to relax the GI smooth muscle, and antidepressants. Exercise and stress management are also really key treatments for this population. Uh, going along with that is cognitive behavioral therapy, so that helps to identify and reduce the triggers of these um, exacerbations. And biofeedback is also utilized to relax the muscles. The prognosis is uh, good in terms of mortality. It's not a life-threatening disorder. It's possible to control the symptoms through medication, regular physical activity, stress management. If you're not controlling your symptoms or not getting it treated at all, it can significantly affect your day-to-day -day life. It can cause people to avoid certain foods because they think it's causing their flare-ups, and this can lead to nutritional deficiencies. It's also a pretty expensive disorder to have. Uh, it was found that affected people use 50% more healthcare resources, which are not free, and um, so that can add up for them. Some of the PT implications are regular physical activity, managing stress levels, trying to control those signs and symptoms. You may need to avoid exercises with drying or jumping as they can increase the pain. We wanna encourage these patients to continue their home exercise program even during a flare up because it can actually help control their symptoms. And we want to be alert to compensations such as breath holding or hyperventilating in response to stress. So educating the patients about diet so they don't become malnourished and then proper breathing as well. So for diverticular disease, that is our next one. This is a, a broad term. It's used to describe diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is the presence of outpouchings or diverticula in the wall of the colon or small intestine. Diverticulitis is when those diverticula become inflamed and infected. So the most common site in Western countries is the sigmoid colon. Uh, most common in Asian countries is the right side of the colon. This disorder is present in almost half of adults greater than 60 years old. It's more common in men when they're um, less than 50 years old, but it's seen more frequently in older women. So the risk factors, uh, the main three that I wanna emphasize are constipation, physical activity, and a red meat heavy diet. Um, shout out to Jim on the side here, he is an example of physical inactivity. 
Some other risk factors are obesity, smoking, NSAID use, uh, chronic steroid or immunosuppressant use, and it's also linked to some connected tissue disorders. The etiology is really just genetics and then lifestyle and diet. Um, so again, like those risk factors that I mentioned. Pathogenesis, so diverticula, like I said before, are the weak points in the colon wall. So the mucosa and the submucosa are able to herniate through the muscular layers of the colon, and that forms these outpouchings. The tinea coli muscle becomes thickened, as well as the plique circularis muscle. Um, both of these becoming thickened increases the intraluminal pressure. We also see an increased production of collagen, and diverticulosis can sometimes cause weakening of blood vessels and bleeding. So it's asymptomatic for 80% of people. Um, if you do have symptoms, you'll usually experience bloating, cramping, irregular bowel movements, flatulence, and mild nonspecific pain. At the point where it becomes diverticulitis, when it becomes inflamed, that's when you'll experience episodic or chronic abdominal pain in the lower quarter or mid-abdomen, also fever, change in bowel habits, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and then eating, and anything that increases the abdominal pressure can increase the pain. For diagnosis, it's gonna be medical history and physical exam. You can confirm your diagnosis with CT of the abdomen or pelvis, or run a lab test to check the white blood cell count for infection. Prevention is again, um, lifestyle changes. So decreasing your red meat intake, getting adequate fluids and fiber intake, smoking cessation and exercise. Treatment includes antibiotics, bowel rest, um, pain control, exercise, and in certain cases, they will recommend a sigmoidectomy, so that's when they will just remove a portion of the colon. The prognosis is good overall, especially if you know that you have it and you can try to treat it. It has a low mortality overall. Um, it is worse with a few complications, for example, abscesses, fistulas, or obstructions. Frank perforations and peritonitis are also related to a high mortality. So the PT implications for diverticular disease are um, reinforcing the importance of exercise, um, especially during periods of remission, uh, avoiding activities that increase the intra-abdominal pressure to avoid further herniation, education about proper body mechanics to reduce this increased pressure, and then screening people who come in with low back pain because that can often be uh, an area of referred pain for these for these people. All right, I hope you guys all enjoyed learning about the uh, diverticular disease. Now we're going to be moving on to neoplasms. That was my first thought as well. Um, what's a neoplasm? So basically, neoplasm is just a fancy word for an abnormal growth in the tissue of the body, or abnormal growth in tissue in the body. Uh, and then when we're talking about abnormal growths of tissue in the body in the GI tract, they're called intestinal polyps. So uh, that's just a growth or mass protruding into the intestinal lumen from any area of the mucous membrane. Um, two types are neoplastic and non-neoplastic. We're not gonna get into those today, maybe next class. Um, benign tumors, uh, most common site of those are in your small intestine. And those are all of your, your omas, your lipomas, your adenomas, that other long that word there that has an oma in it. And then we have uh, malignant tumors. Those are also commonly found in the small intestine compared to the large intestine or colon. But uh, those, are, those get there through being metastasized from adjacent organs, such as the pancreas, the stomach, or the colon. Speaking of the colon, we're going to spend a lot of our time today, or while I'm talking, uh, about colorectal cancer. Um, it's the third leading cause of cancer among American men and women. And uh, so we're going to spend most of our time on that. But you guys do need to know just a little bit of background history about the malignant, the nine tumors, and the pulpits. So going on, going forth, uh, first thing, um, intestinal polyps. So uh, more than two-thirds of the population older than 65 have at least one polyp. Yeah, uh, my friend Joe Dirt, he's pretty, pretty surprised by that statistic. 
um, of these intestinal pull-ups, only about 1% of them are cancerous if they have a diameter less than one centimeter. And then about 50% of them that are greater than two centimeters are cancerous. And then colorectal cancer is the third leading cause of cancer, like I said before, but it's also uh, the third leading cause of cancer death in men and women as well. So it's pretty deadly. Um, the overall incidence and mortality rates though are on the decline and that is due to screening and it is also due to increase in just uh, medical abilities. So etiological and risk factors for an intestinal pull-up. Um, if you're over 65, obviously we just had that last statistic that uh, two thirds of people over 65 have them. So makes sense. Uh, family history of them, tobacco, alcohol use, obesity, race, um, and then going to colorectal cancer cause of colon cancer is unknown, but some uh, things that play a role in it are the environmental and family factors, genetics, gender, males obviously more than females, uh, geographics, race, diabetes, and irritable bowel disease. And here's just kind of a picture showing the, the big six of risk factors for colon, colorectal cancer. So, Pathology of the colorect of colorectal cancer. It is a slow process, so it takes several years for it to come up, so it makes it easier to identify at an early stage. But it does begin as an anomatose polyp, and then it develops into an anoma with a high-grade dysplasia, which is uh, basically means that it uh, kind of mimics a, a tumor or a, a cancerous tumor, my bad. Uh, lastly, it will progress into an invasive cancer. And uh, the one thing about uh, colorectal cancer is it's not just caused by one mutation. So that's why we said that we don't know the cause of it, but uh, it is just, we do know that it's caused by multiple changes. And then here's a picture of how it uh, starts as just a pull up and then it goes, gets into an adenoma and then turns into carcinoma. So clinical manifestations for colorectal cancer. Uh, it has very few signs and symptoms. I know I have some listed here, but uh, a lot of patients are asymptomatic and don't, sh uh, don't show any of them. So ocular blood loss that is bleeding in the, uh, the intestines or the colon, and that doesn't show up when you use the restroom. So that's a tough sign or, sign or symptom to see. However, there is uh, also, uh, hematochesia is how I'm going to pronounce that. Um, but that is blood in the stool, and there's also a bright red blood from the rectum it is uh, some signs and symptoms. And then you have your other uh, ones that show up with, all, with most other cancers, the weight loss, the change in bowel and bladder. Um, so like I said, many of them are asymptomatic until METS occurs, and then complications from METS and secondary um, include intestinal obstruction. That makes sense because you're having uh, your intestines shrink due to these tumors inside of there, so things are not going to be flowing very well through there. Um, the tumors are embedded in your intestinal wall, so that leads to the GI bleeding. There's also perforation and ascites. Oh, and I didn't show you a picture, so I figured if there's ever a good time to have a prostate joke, this would be the lecture to do it. Yeah. Two, two, one. Okay. So, medical management. Screening and prevention is the big thing. So, it takes about 10 to 15 years for a pull up to become cancer. So, uh, screens are very effective. You have plenty of time to see uh, these abnormal growths growing. Um, unfortunately, 22 Americans between the ages of 50 and 70 don't get screened. Um, that's uh, predicted to be 25,000 lives could be saved just by doing screens. Um, and then if you don't get a casual screen, you can also get a test for bloody, spool, bloody stool. And if that test back comes back positive, then you go on to get a colonoscopy. And uh, with the colonoscopy combined with the uh, just the regular prevention screen, 
they can reduce the incidence of cancer up to 67%. Uh, colonoscopy information, just real quick, this isn't uh, need to know information, just kind of trivia, you know, when you, when you drink at a trivia contest. Uh, should be performed every 10 years for people over 50. I say people, not persons. People over 50 uh, that are average risk for colorectal cancer. Uh, the US Preventative Services Task Force, yes, that is a real thing, recommends that a routine screen ends at the age of 75, and then definitely no more screens after 85. And here's just uh, how a colonoscopy is. Obviously, they put it up there and they can go into your colon, intestines, or however far they need to, to get a look at what they want. All right, so diagnosis, staging, and treatment. So diagnose, it's diagnosed through a rectal examination, whether it's colonoscopy or a CT scan. Uh, there's five stages, starting with stage zero, which is uh, cancer cells are only in the mu mucus or mucosa. Stage one, cancer has grown through the mucosa and invaded the muscular layer of the colon. Uh, stage two, tumor extends into or through the rectal wall, sometimes reaching surrounding tissue. Stage three, it gets to the lymph nodes, and then stage four is where it metastasizes and spreads to other body parts like the small intestine. Um, the main treatment is surgical removal of the tumor, um, and obviously that's before METS, so ideally we like to get in and remove the tumor before it metastasizes and that 10 to 15 years for it to grow kind of gives us that opportunity. And there's also chemotherapy that sometimes is treated as well or used for treatment. Here's the picture. Zero, one, two, three gets into the lymphatic system, then four starts to spread other ones. Okay. Oh, you weren't supposed to see rainbow yet. Prognosis. Um, five year survival rate for all stages combined is 64%. So that's not bad. It's pretty, it's pretty good for a cancer. Uh, if they catch it in the local stages and start having treatment, then they have a 90% survival rate. That's what Rambo likes. He gives two thumbs up. Oh, oh, saw your Kegels too. All right. Um, if it's caught in the regional stages, then uh, they still have a 69% five year survival rate, which is still not bad. But if they don't catch it until it metastasizes, then they only have about a 12% five-year survival rate. And the, the deeper the tumor goes, the worse the prognosis. So the longer the tumor is in your body, it starts growing deeper into your, your colon or into your wall. And that uh, reduces the chances of survival. Um, PT focus is to improve function and mobility after abdominal surgery. So uh, just normal kind of range of motion, strength, if any of that's lost during surgery. Um, after surgery, most of the time, um, post-op session with a PT is to analyze gait, just to make sure everything's looking normal there. And then sometimes there is uh, bowel incontinence, so pelvic floor exercises are important in these circumstances. That's where you get your Kegel exercises. I'll be talking about appendicitis today, which is the most common disease of the appendix where it becomes inflamed and often results in necrosis and perforation. Appendicitis occurs between the age of 15 to 19 years old usually, more often in men. 50% 50 50 of the time it is idiopathic with a third of the time being obstruction, which prevents drainage. The obstruction can be based off of a tumor, a foreign body, or parasites. So as you can see from the picture, this is the common area of appendicitis. This can occur with two different ways. The lumen can become obstructive, which I talked about in the last slide, with inflammation in the mucosa, where intraluminal pressure rises, causing ischemia, necrosis, and perforation. This is often seen with a high-grade fever. The second way is bacterial infection, this is less prevalent because over the years we've had increase in hygiene um, practices in the US, but it also occurs with infected mucosa and an ulceration results. Common sim symptoms of appendicitis is constant abdominal pain with tenderness in McBurney's point. McBurney's point is 
1.5 to 2 inches supermedial to the anterior superiliac spine, um, which is to the umbilicus. So this can also be accompanied with nausea, vomiting, a white blood cell count of 20,000 or greater, tense or rigid abdomen, a low-grade fever, pelvic pain in women, confusion in older adults, and a withdrawn appearance with children or infants. With increased symptoms, this can often be caused by abdominal pressure, such as when you cough, uh, with walking, laughing, or bending over. Diagnosis of appendicitis can be based off of a patient history, physical examination, remount, rebound tenderness, and the pinch and inch test. So this is a positive test if pain increases when the pinch skin returns. So if you look over at this picture, over that McBurney's point, the therapist pinches the skin and then releases it rapidly. If pain increases with this test, it is positive. Also, you can diagnose appendicitis through a urinalysis, the elevated white blood cell count of the 200,000 or above, and an abdominal CT. PT implications for appendicitis are when you see symptoms over the right thigh, groin, pelvic, or any referred hip pain. You can also perform the pinch and inch test, and you need to refer for further me medical attention if any of the above tests are positive. So when an, a test is positive, the patient should lie down and be quiet um, just to prevent the increase in ad abdominal pressure. Take nothing, including water, by mouth, and no heat should be applied to the area. Treatment for appendicitis is with an appendectomy, which is the surgical removal of the appendix. This is an open procedure done, or it's done laparoscopically. Um, and then patients need to be taking antibiotics preoperatively. Pre so with an accurate uh, diagnosis and an early removal of the appendix, the mortality and morbidity rate is less than 1%. So it's a good prognosis if it's seen early. Symptoms for peritonitis is decreases in intestinal motility, intestinal distension with gas, a uh, vague or generalized abdominal pain, which is seen early, rigid abdomen, which is sensitive to touch and rebound tenderness. In the late stages, you'll see severe pain, which increases with movement and breathing. There's also can be referred shoulder and thoracic pain, nausea, vomiting, high fever, abdominal abscess, and it can also lead to sepsis or multi-organ dysfunction. The diagnosis and treatment for peritonitis is with abdominal films from a CT, um, abdominal tap, surgical drainage and repair of the area, and tre treated with antibiotics. So for a physical therapist, the implications are to monitor vital signs, um, be familiar with the underlying causes and complications with these conditions. After surgery, you need to be aware of position changes, um, seeing caution with no further increase in pain from a surgical incision. And you need to be aware that um, symptoms can also be fever and pain, which could disorient the patient. So in a hospital setting, making sure the patient is in a safe environment and raising the side rails up on their bed. We're getting near the end, folks, and we finally reached the hemorrhoids. Now, in my opinion, I think the best way to learn about hemorrhoids is to really get a hands-on learning experience. Fair enough, Doug. Of course, I could get a hell of a good look at a T-bone steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's word for it. <laughs> bull's ass, that's great. Good point, Tom. So take my word for it, and I'll teach you more than you wanted to know. So what are hemorrhoids? Well, I'll tell you what they're not. In the, before the 19th century, people used to believe that hemorrhoids were caused by excessive spanking and were cured by leeches around the anus. And that's not the case. Up until recently, medicine believed that hemorrhoids were caused by, or that hemorrhoids were anal varicose veins. 
And that theory has currently been debunked. Now, hemorrhoids are known as the involvement of the sliding of the anal canal lining that causes the veins to dilate. So who gets hemorrhoids? Well, anyone can. About 1 million people or about 1 in 20 people. Even celebrities like Lil Wayne. Not to be confused with Lil John. What? So yeah, Lil Wayne. Apparently in 2011, he was arrested for attempted gun possession, but his jail imprisonment was postponed for a while until he underwent surgery for hemorrhoids. I hope that went well for you, Lil Wayne. So risk factors for hemorrhoids include inactivity, a poor diet, diet including diets in high or low in fiber, alcohol consumption and spicy food, constipation can lead to hemorrhoids, and prolonged straining. So what causes hemorrhoids? Well, the pathology behind it is the abnormal downwards displacement of the anal cushions causing venous dilation. Some pathological changes that occur include abnormal venous drainage, vascular thrombosis, degenerative process of collagen fibers and fibroelastic tissues, distortion or rupture of the anal subepithelial muscle, vascular wall inflammation, and high resting anal pressure. Whew. If you feel like there's a tree stump in a Louisiana swamp with a higher IQ than you, you're not alone. That was a lot. So let's simplify it and let's review the anatomy down there first. So remember, the rectum is the most posterior element of the pelvic viscera. And the most defining boundaries for our purposes for this class include the dentate line. So down here, between these two pink structures on this black dotted line, that's your dentate line. It's the boundary between the viscera and the body wall. The pectinate or dentate line is also surrounded by the superior and inferior rectal arteries. So we also have the internal and external rectal plexuses or plexi, I guess. So this arrow here is pointing to the internal rectal plexus that consists of connective tissue between the internal anal sphincter and the anal canal epithelium. And this is what, what will lead to internal hemorrhoids. On the outside, we have the external rectal plexus, which consists of subcutaneous tissue, and this encircles the external anal sphincter. And this, as you can guess, is where you'll find your external hemorrhoids. So remember at the beginning I mentioned that hemorrhoids were the sliding of the anal canal lining that causes the veins to dilate. These involve anal cushions. No, not that kind of anal cushion. So anal cushions are the anal submucosa that's located in either the right anterior, the left lateral, or the right posterior part that includes the venous the, I'm sorry, the includes the rectal venous plexus. So what does this mean? We have the superior rectal artery over here, and it um, supplies branches to the major anal cushions. If you look like at the anus, like a clock face, the common sites for the anal cushions are the three o'clock position, which is the left lateral, the seven o'clock position, which is the right posterior, and the 11 o'clock position, which is the right anterior. These anal cushions are supported by smooth muscle and elastic, elastic tissue, and they are pushed when strained. So there are two types of hemorrhoids. There are internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids are superior to that dentate or that pectate line. Remember we talked about that? The dentate line is right here. And anything superior to that will be an internal hemorrhoid. An external hemorrhoid, on the other hand, will be anything inferior to the dentate line. So some signs and symptoms 
for hemorrhoids, if you hadn't guessed it already, would be pure burning, puritis, and bleeding, and the feeling of incomplete evacu evacuation. So if you have an internal hemorrhoid, the bleeding will be painless, but if you have an external hemorrhoid, it's gonna hurt like a son of a gun when you bleed. So how to prevent hemorrhoids? Pretty much avoid all the risk factors so you won't end up like Lil Wayne. And if you think you do have hemorrhoids, you can go uh, see your doctor for some examination via digital endoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy. So a digital endoscopy involves inserting the device into the anal canal to have a look around. And the sigmoidoscopy, <clears throat> excuse me, involves inserting a probe through the whole rectum and all the way up to the sigmoid column. But that's just a line, yep. To classify hemorrhoids, we have the Golliger's classification of internal hemorrhoids. So pictured here, a first degree internal hemorrhoid is where the uh, anal cushion will bleed, but it does not prolapse. So it stays uh, superior to that dentate line. The second degree internal hemorrhoid, the uh, prolapse will, the prolapse <laughs> on straining, it will come past that dentate line, but will recoil once the pressure is done being exerted. A third degree uh, prolapse will be on straining and will need manual reinsertion to put the hemorrhoid back into the anal canal. And as you can probably guess, the fourth degree internal hemorrhoid, that prolapse remains out all the time. So how can we treat these suckers? Well, not with leeches like they did way back in the day, but there are many conservative methods. One of the most commonly known conservative methods are uh, topical ointments, like is commercialized here. To the God of Israelites, or to drink to your knees and legs with painful boils spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. <clears throat> God bless my child. I understand. Can you see? Thanks, God. If you don't want the heavenly relief from Ansel, you can try a sitz bath. A sitz bath is a shallow bowl that you can set on the top of the toilet. And when you sit down, your anus will be submerged in the liquid. Sometimes doctors will put or prescribe you medication to put in your sitz bath. You can also avoid these by having a high fiber diet, avoid Valsalva and constipation, Moderate aerobic exercise is great because that will stimulate bowel function. And some medications you can take are oral flavonoids and calcium dobesylate. So if that is not enough, there are some surgical and medical procedures. So for first and second degree hemorrhoids, you can undergo a rubber band ligation. It's exactly how it sounds. You put a rubber band on the hemorrhoid to cut off the circulation and let the sucker die. It's quick, simple, and effective. Another option is sclerotherapy. This is currently what's recommended for first and second degree hemorrhoids. In scler sclerotherapy, they will inject chemicals like shown here into the submucosa at the base of the hemorrhoid. The doctors will not inject the chemicals into the hemorrhoid itself. Uh, and this is for first and second degree hemorrhoids. Another option is a hemorrhoidectomy, which are for third and fourth degree in hemorrhoids. And that's what's currently recommended for third and fourth degree. This is where they go in and physically remove the hemorrhoid but it also is good because it has the lowest rate of reoccurrence. So the prognosis for hemorrhoids are pretty good. Uh, most can be resolved with conservative treatment and lifestyle changes. And like we just mentioned, the hemorrhoid has the lowest rate of recurrence for stages three and four internal hemorrhoids. 
also special implications for us as future physical therapists. Just be careful with exercises that may cause increased abdominal, intra-abdominal pressure with your patients. When positioning your patient, position them in prone or sideline. If you need to position them supine or seated, you can use one of these rubber ring pillows. And if they continue to have spasms, you might need to refer them to pelvic, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy. Well, it looks like we've gotten to the end of the gastrointestinal tract, literally and figuratively. Jim, thank you for letting us borrow your office. It's been great hosting. Jim and Becky, is there anything else you'd like to say? Thank you all for joining us today for this in-depth lecture. Uh, go on about your day, enjoy your breakfast, lunch, dinner, wherever this finds you throughout your day. If you have any questions about this lecture, go ask Polly or Ed. He loves this stuff. Preach. Much like this fountain, my humor is dry.